So the most distinctive thing about Marx is his analytical approach, something that's known as historical materialism. And this, in fact, sets him apart from other thinkers, uh, especially thinkers like Durkheim and like Weber. Um, but most clearly for us here, this distinguishes him from Smith. Right? Um, and this is, I think, why Marx and Smith view the same basic thing, capitalism, but view it in very different terms. Um, it's because Marx is coming from a historical materialist perspective. So we really need to understand what Marx means by historical materialism, what this type of analysis looks like. It's very central in the same way that Durkheim's understanding of social facts was central to the way Durkheim analyzes the world. So let's start here. What Marx is trying to do in his analysis, the thing he's trying to figure out, is he wants to uncover the laws of motion of society. The beginning of the Communist Manifesto, he sets this out very clearly, stating that all history is the history of class struggle. He's trying to uncover the dynamics of history, and his answer is going to be that history operates through class struggle. So to get to this particular form of analysis, we really need to understand how he views human nature. And the real question that he starts off asking is, well, what is the thing that makes human beings unique as a species? That is to say, what is what he'll call our species being? And so if you, if you sort of think about that, what is... Think about that with another species. What is the nature of bees? Well, bees take existing nature and they use it to survive. They pollinate flowers to produce honey within honeycombs. Right? And this is an instinctual aspect of bees and they use it as a means to live. They don't think about it. They don't plan it out. They just do it. And as long as bees have existed, this is how they have survived. So the key thing in thinking about the uniqueness of the species being, if you will, of bees is that they're not applying ideas to transform the world, the world around them, into something unique. They have an instinct, and they follow the same pattern uh, over and over, using that instinct to survive, not really thinking about it at all. Human beings are very different than that. Human beings have a distinctive species being, Human beings create the world around us. We take the material world around us and we transform it through our own productive, creative endeavors uh, into something new in order to survive. We apply our ideas to creating something that has never existed before. Remember, bees have for centuries done the exact same thing over and over. Human beings use new technologies to take and harvest wood and convert that wood, or to harvest trees, convert that into wood, and convert that into houses. And we make ever grander houses and ever grander uh, building, buildings and architectural structures. So the, the key thing that makes human beings unique then is that we apply ideas to create new things in the world around us. Human Labor is the foundation of society, and we use that labor to transform the world around us. And this is what gives us, Marx argues, the capacity for growth. We can produce new things. We can move from the pen and the paper to computers. We can create new and beautiful objects. We convert the world around us into paintings and into music and into things that, that are beautiful. And so it's this distinctive thing that makes us and gives us our species being. And so you should see this as Marx's distinctive assumption about human nature. And importantly, this labor that we engage in is most often always, for, for Marx, a collective process. We have to enter into social relationships with, with one another in order to, to accomplish these, uh, in order to transform the world around us. So this is the crucial assumption that Marx makes, and it's the starting point for his understanding of history. And it's going, we're, this is, we're going to see how this allows him uh, to sort of view history as evolving out of this human nature 
as well as he will argue the way in which particular historical social relations can distort our human nature. So there's a real moral critique inside this argument as well. So this, in a nutshell, leads him into a historical materialist perspective. So what is historical materialism? At its core, what he's arguing is that the way in which societies provide for their material needs, the way in which we enter into social relations to transform the world around us into the things we need to survive, conditions the totality of society. It shapes every other aspect, all of our social relations, institutions, and ideas. It shapes uh, our religious institutions. It shapes the family, the way in which we engage in education and schooling, politics. All of this is structured and organized by and through and reflecting of the material conditions of society, the way in which we organize uh, to provide for our material needs. In this way, human labor becomes the foundation of society. We have to understand how it is that a society organizes the production, the transformation of the things around, around us into the things we need to survive, how it is that we harness human labor to produce those things in order to understand how the rest of society or, is organized and operates. So that, in a nutshell, then, is historical materialism. What this allows Marx to do, then, is to see history moving in particular stages. So he argues that we move from uh, early human societies that were or organized through primitive communism into slave-based societies, into feudal-based societies, into capitalistic societies, and then ultimately he thinks we will move into what he calls communist societies. And there's a real question mark, um, of course, historically, there, and it was for Marx, this was the endpoint goal. This is what he thought would be the kind of end of history, uh, this sort of uh, movement into, into communism. So you can look up and figure out all the distinctive nuances between these distinct stages of history. What matters for us here is that each of these dis stages is dis defined by a distinctive mode of production. This is a core idea for Marx, modes of production, and it's intimately related to his historical materialist analysis. So let's unpack what he means by mode of production, because it's a complicated concept. When Marx talks about a mode of production, uh, he's arguing that, uh, the, that this is the way in which we organize human activity in a particular time and place to provide for material needs. He calls that the mode of production. So the way in which we organize for producing our needs is a mode of production. And modes of production are made up of two basic things, forces of production and relations of production. So modes of production comprise these two distinctive things, the particular forces of production and a distinctive set of relations of production. So what are the forces of production? These are made up of two things themselves, the means of production and labor power. The means of production is simply all of the tools that are required for producing a particular thing. It's like the technology that goes into things. If you're a carpenter, your tools are hammer and nails, right? If you're a painter, your tools are the canvas and uh, the paint and the, the paint brush, right? These are your means of production. These are the things that enable you to produce the particular object or thing that, that, is, that you are producing. Your labor power is very different because this is simply the capacity for you to engage in work. Right? It's the ability for you to wake up every day and go out and hammer, use the means of production to hammer the nail into the wall. Right? Um, so means of production, the things we use to produce labor power is our capacity to exert ourselves, our own labor into producing particular things. Um, so these together are like all of the things that are applied in the actual act of production. Now the relations of production are a little bit trickier and harder to figure out because these are the particular social relationships that go into defining how production happens. Who owns the means of production? Who controls the means of production? Right? Who controls labor power? 
who does what in the production process, uh, who controls what uh, and whom, who determines how long a person is going to work, who determines how they're going to use the hammer um, in the act of production. And so here, uh, this is sort of like how the means of production and the labor power of individuals interact with one another and come together uh, uh, to produce particular things. So we have to combine the forces of production and the relations of production to generate a particular mode of production. So it's the interaction of these two things that defines a particular mode of production. So understand these particular concepts. They're, they're the kind of generic concepts that Marx gives us to think about um, as part of his historical materialist framework, and they're going to be critical to understanding how it is that he goes about critiquing capitalism and why he sees capitalism uh, in, in such different terms than Smith does.